I'd like for you to write down seven things at the top of your sheet of paper, seven things I wish every man knew, seven things that I wish every man knew. Everyone carries a different knowledge base. One of the greatest suggestions from a man of God that I ever received, and I guess it wasn't a suggestion, it was mentorship from Dr. Marcerillo. He said, never talk to people based on how you are, but based on who they are. Based on who they are. We know that as fathers, we don't talk to our four-year-old like we would talk to uh, other people. We talk to them based on who they are. And um, every man has a different knowledge base and a different collection of experiences. When I say father, I have a different image than you do. When I say mother, I have a different image in my mind than you do. So all of us enter every conversation with a variety of experiences and persuasions. And the basic difference in men is what they consider the most important. There are seven difference, major differences in people. But there's a major difference in people, and that is what they consider most important. Turn to Proverbs, and you watching there at your home today, we're thrilled that you're there at the Internet and being a part of our family. And uh, I want to say a big hello to my sisters, Deborah and Kadana, that I know are watching there on that big screen in Leesville, Louisiana. I love you two very, very much. and glad you're a part. And also in Australia, Dr. Rob Thompson just texted me. They're watching actually all over the world today, and we're thankful that you're a part of this. Proverbs 2, verse 6, 12, and 16. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding, verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, verse 16, to deliver thee from the strange woman. And that's the purpose of wisdom, is to expose wrong people. That's the purpose of wisdom. 95%, 98% of all your problems in life will be with a person probably less than 10 major people. But that will be the major parts of your life is having a wrong people. And wrong people last a long time. And they never leave voluntarily. <laughs> they never leave voluntarily. And uh, I want to talk to you about seven things that I wish every man knew. Oh, I thought this was plugged up. Hold on one second. Number one, I wish every man knew his divine role in every relationship. I wish every man knew his divine role, what God expected in every relationship. What God expects from you towards your wife, it may be different than what she expects. God's expectations of you towards your children may be different than what they expect. They may want you to be in every football game, every soccer game, every little thing that there's involved. And, uh, but what is your divine role? What is your divine role in the life of your children? I think a father decides what men, what children believe. Mothers decide what children remember. But fathers decide what they believe. We know that because many of the men in prisons have Christian mothers, but they never embrace the God of their mother. They embrace the God of their father. The majority of men embrace what their father believes. So the father has a role to be the conscience in the life of the child. Now, sometimes mothers do the agitating and the uh, worrying and the constant prodding and asking them to do this, and why didn't you do that? But the father is has a, a role of being a conscience. And it, I wish every father, every man, knew his divine role in every relationship that he has. Is my role here to be a protege? Is my role here to be the mentor? Is my role here to be the conscience? 
is my role in this person's life to be the encourager. That takes constant and continuous attentiveness to the voice of the Holy Spirit. There are times in my life I want to be a brother. And uh, sometimes it's so good to have Pastor Jeff Arrigo with us today all the way from New York. One of my closest, precious friends in the ministry. He and his wife, and he has got a family out of this world. And uh, he'll call and leave me a message. He, he comes down here just to love on me a little bit and knows when I need it too. And the pastor's a precious, precious group of people in New York. And Pastor Jeff left a message. He'll leave a message from me. He says, I love you, Dad. And sometimes say, Dad, do I look that old? Am I getting that? Am I, am I that far down the road here? And uh, Pastor Jeff, there's a lot of people calling me uh, a father in the Lord. And, and, you know, I don't feel that old. I, I consider my dad, I, I think he's supposed to be 90 before you're a father in the Lord. But... Uh, you have to discern what is your divine role in someone's life, in every person's life. What is my role here to be a confidant? Is my role here to be an encourager? I wish that every man would invest time in trying to discern the role in the, in the life of his daughter. Very few daughters that have a sad experience with their father come out whole and well and with joy toward life. Subconsciously, even the sons want the approval of the father. And I want to say this. It's real critical to children in a family, very critical, that you affirm your children and let them know what you see different in them, what you like in them. Uh, what you deserve. Now, if your father never received that from his father, he probably didn't give it to you. But I think it's critical. I think it's crucial. I think it's important that there be conversations without accusation and without correction. I believe it's important that every father have conversations with his son that don't have correction in them. There's just some, there needs to be some real role playing here. What is my part in this person's life? Even when you see someone going a wrong way, ask the Lord, what, how can I best communicate this? Fathers are known by silence, and silence is usually misinterpreted. Silence is a control weapon. I have members of my staff that use silence to control me, try to. It doesn't work too well. They just sit there and look when I ask questions. The struggle showed. I'm very, very aware of the subtle use of silence by men. I'm used to that. I'm accustomed to that. I'm accustomed to silence at a table when someone wants to withhold information from you that they know that you really won't. But in a world of trust, in a world of trust, it is very important to have affirmation. Has to be. Has to be. And it can't be um, surface. It can't be unmeaningful. It has to be real. I'll never forget a guy years ago I was preaching for in Florida. On the way from the service, he said, I tell you, you were awesome today. Awesome. You were awesome. I can't tell you how good that made me feel. I was like this. I was like this. We went and went through the line at a little buffet, and he sat down across from me, and he sipped his soup. He says, have you tasted this soup yet? I said, no. I said, it's awesome. I tell you, all the pride I had felt <laughs> about being an awesome preacher left me. I thought, this is one of those guys where... You know, everything is awesome, from an apple that's cut to a tomato. And that was disappointing to me. Word, make your words meaningful. Seven things I wish every man knew. I wish you knew your divine role. I wish a, you as a son would know your role in the life of your father, that you would affirm him and thank him for bringing to the world. 
and thank him for his investment in you. Thank him for the times that he taught you and fed you. Many times I'll put my arm around my dad and I said, Dad, I don't know how in the world what sustains you to feed all of us seven children and to keep us and keep praying and keep leading us to prayer, etc. Know the distinction of your role. Know what you bring to someone else's life. Know what God's role is. And I say that divine role. Obviously, you need to discern how they see your role. You may be sugar daddy. Usually you are. You, you, usually you're the, you're, the, you're the money, and when the money stops, the relationship stops. Most, most relationships are like that. But you need to know your relationship and what is God's expectations of me. Number two, I wish every man knew the favor that honor would produce in their life. I wish every man knew the favor from God and man that honor would produce. Honor is in the tone. Honor is in the countenance. Honor is in the words. Honor is in every part, and so is dishonor. Every sin is the sin of dishonor. Fellows, I really, I was thinking this morning, because I'm really trying to really put emphasis on uh, what I really wish you knew. I really wish you knew the impact of honor on the earth. That if you exude honor, honor toward a boss who's over you, who writes your checks, and because he has honored your gift, you're able to feed your family, buy insurance, buy a car, everything you do. Honor the wife who has taken your name, bore your children, and chosen to walk beside you through every storm in your life. Honoring children. Honor must be taught. It has to be taught. It doesn't come natural. Honoring the people that God has brought around your life to help you succeed. Probably the last 12 months has probably bought me, bought me uh, probably the greatest amount of dishonor I've ever known, probably collectively in my life. The last 12 months I have experienced more personal dishonor than I have in 61 years of my whole life combined. I've never seen anything like it, never known anything like it. And not only has it been a destructive thing inside him, but, but it's been an instructive thing toward me. And as I have watched various things of dishonor, they've come through the people usually you do the most for. You make the greatest investment in. You try the hardest to help them succeed. You put the most energy in them. And uh, as you know, every gift creates guilt or gratitude. And those who are not thankful become angry and retaliatory because you've tilted, you've tilted the relationship. Anytime there's uh, a, in, uh, anytime, to me, gratitude is the equalizer. It's the only way I can come boldly to God is in thankfulness. Thankfulness makes you an equalizer in every, in every uh, relationship. But God has been teaching me so much on honor, and I watched the pain that I experienced through dishonor, through dishonor. Disrespect and uh, trivializing my instructions and trivializing my words and sneering at, at my desires and things. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been a real experience, a devastating experience. And I've come back to God and said, God, who have I dishonored and how can I correct it? If I was a... If I was really interested in 2009, in a few minutes we're going to move into another section on finances, I would really ask myself the question today, who are, is there anyone I have dishonored? Is there anyone I have created the perception of dishonor? Maybe you didn't mean it, but what you did gave the perception of dishonor. I believe there's people that I have dishonored, not knowingly. I would never, never knowingly dishonor someone, ever. But sometimes I've made mistakes and I did something that really could be perceived as dishonor and bring correction to them. If you as a man, if you really knew what honor would produce in your life, you would ask God to help you excel in the demonstration of honor. In your words, in the kindness. Three, I wish every man 
knew the self-confidence that a relationship with the Holy Spirit produces. I wish you knew the self-confidence. It's what keeps you going when nobody else is for you. It's what sustains you. It's what keeps you, what keeps you focused. I urge you to have a place called the secret place. Lately, I've been using my last few months, I've been using my bedroom as my secret place because we're doing some things downstairs in my secret place. And I found myself even this morning praying in the Holy Ghost. Last night, praying in the Holy Ghost. I cannot communicate how powerful your self-confidence becomes when you and the Holy Spirit are in unity. It's supernatural. Uh, you stop needing affirmation from men and women. People's approval means less than ever after you've been in the presence of God. I believe that something happens in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you that he is the invisible Jesus who walks on your right side. He is not a cloud. He's not power. He is a person. He speaks. He thinks. He talks. He is the spirit of wisdom. He knows everything. He's the spirit of knowledge. He is the spirit of life. He is the only person capable of being completely contented with you. Nobody Nobody has liked, uh, liked all of you. I can't think of one person who needs all of me. But the Holy Spirit not only loves all of you, but he embraces all of you. Invest moments with him. Develop your prayer language. I wish every man knew that self-confidence, true self-confidence comes from the approval of the Holy Spirit. True self-confidence does not come in how much you've accomplished. By the time you finish building a house, you've got three more houses in your head. By the time you've reached last year's goal, you're way ahead of that. By the time you reach this year's goal, you've got another goal for the next several years. The fourth thing I wish every man knew is the power of right words. I wish every man knew the power of right words. Labor for effective conversation. Labor to choose meaningful words. Labor for accuracy in words. Words are more important than anybody is telling you. I've heard people say, well, well, uh, you know how I feel. I said, not unless you speak it. Anything unspoken is unheard. Anything unheard is unfelt. God loved words so much, he called himself the word. Labor for appropriate words. Labor for words that inspire. Labor for accuracy in your words. I was talking with my sister Deborah on the phone this morning on the way here, and I mentioned to her, I said, I have come to a conclusion of what agitates me. The word evasion is very powerful, and she had mentioned that word. When there is an attempt to evade truth, or slither, or stop me from knowing something, or how many has ever had people that, I call it slither, I think the newspaper, news media calls it spin, how many, you can't say what, how many has been around people that they will never take a side, I've got people that love me, are loyal to me, but they'll never take my side, when they talk to me, they talk as if they're talking on a recorder, and they'll never take my side. If I'm upset with something, well, I guess everybody, everybody uh, has their their side to it. I, I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy kind of that kind of relationship. I don't, I don't like a relationship that doesn't take sides. I like genuine, I like real, I like straight. That's what now it'll limit you. It'll limit you. I said one time, if you can live with laziness and lying. Life will be a beach for you. <laughs> but I like straightness. I like straightforwardness. I like, can I trust your words? Can I trust your words? When I make business deals, I'll look at the man right in the eye and say, can I trust what you're saying to me? Can I trust what you're saying to me? That's real big to me. I don't know of anything more important in life than trustworthiness. I know men who will pay a fortune for a trustworthy man. Warren Buffett takes, it takes him two years to find a man 
to lead one of his companies. It takes him two years of constant search. That's over 700 days it takes him. The wealthiest man, second only to Bill Gates, takes him two years, 700 days of constant searching to find a man he can trust in leadership of his company. Say the truth or don't say it. Always be truthful. Always be truthful. Always be truthful. Be truthful on your income tax. Be truthful in your dealings with men. Be truthful with people. Be truthful with your wife. Be truthful with your children. Be truthful. I love what Abraham Lincoln said. He says, if you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. Five. The irreplaceable, the irreplaceable uh, benefit of becoming a lifetime learner, the irreplaceable benefit of becoming a lifetime learner, I wish every man knew what would happen if he had the heart of a protege. Learners attract mentorship. Who do you learn from? What do you want to learn from them? What's the proof you are a master learner? 80% of everyone after 18 years old never buy a book. Can you believe that? 80% after people turn 18 years old and leave school, 80% of the people never buy another book. They say that 7 out of 10 books are never read. 7 out of 10 books that are purchased in stores like Barnes and Nobles are never read. Nine out of the ten who are that are read are never read past chapter one. If you're a master learner, what's the proof? I beg you, I beg you to invest. This is a new Fujitsu slate, holds 250 gigabytes of information, has 61 million words in it, 2,500 books in it. I wouldn't dream of paying $50,000 for a car and nothing on my brain. My mind is worth 10 million times more than my car. My mind is my world. My mind is my world. What's the proof you're a learner? What's the proof you have a heart of a protege? What's the last 10 questions you've asked the smartest person you know? Who are the three smartest people you know? And what is the passion level of your pursuit for them? Your success is determined by your wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to discern difference, difference in people, difference in a moment, difference in an environment, difference in your gifting. I would urge you to become a learner, a master learner. Six, I wish every man knew the eventuality of one wrong person. I wish every man knew the eventuality of one wrong person. Samson could talk to us about that, couldn't he? He had a thousand successes, but he had one voice that affected him. A wrong person is anyone who wake up, wakes up your, your weakness, anyone who trivializes your difference. Identify wrong people. You don't have to publicize it, but identify them. When God wants to bless you, he brings a person to your life. When Satan wants to bless you, he brings a person to your life. When God wants to protect you, he removes a person from your life. Anyone who births doubt, unbelief, is a wrong person. Anyone who weakens your passion for God is a wrong person. Anyone that's untrustworthy is a wrong person. I think anyone who uses your weakness against you at any level, your weakness in giving. I don't care if you've got a daughter who knows when you're tired, you'll give her anything you, she wants, and she waits till you're tired. She works you. You've got a problem on your hands. I wish you knew the eventuality of one wrong person. 
I had no idea when I started out in life that 90% of all my pain would come through misplaced trust. 90% of all the pain of 62 years has come through misplaced trust. That's why wisdom is so important. Seven, I wish every man knew that the law of the seed controlled his entire life. The law of the seed controlled his entire life. Words are seeds, time is seed, love is a seed, money is a seed. I live by the seed faith principle. I've been involved in a situation, I've been trying to settle and bring some, some closure to, brought me a lot of pain. And I woke up the other morning and there's a, there's a warrior in me, there's a battle in me. But I've just finished my book called A Thousand and One Wisdom Keys. We're going to press this next week with it. And one of the wisdom keys, thank you, thank you. One of, the, one of the wisdom keys is never fight a battle that has little reward. Never fight a battle that has little reward. It exhausts you too much. And I woke up and the Lord gave me a word. He says, agree quickly with thine adversary. And then God showed me the power of the seed. Sowing mercy, sowing forgiveness, and sowing money. I would urge you. When you tie this week, wrap expectation around your seed. Develop excellence in expectation. Say the word ex expectation with me. Say it again. I do believe in prosperity. I believe that money is an influence. I believe that money has a voice. And I believe it's the will of God for us to be loaded with his blessing that we might have an amplified voice on the earth. I made up my mind to make the Holy Spirit my financial partner. Have you? I have. Amen. Lift up both hands right now for just a moment. Lift up both hands and repeat this prayer with me. In the name of Jesus, I am a receiver of uncommon wisdom today. Holy Spirit, you are my master mentor. You are my master mentor. I am a receiver today of uncommon wisdom in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong. Evil and righteousness. Difference in people. Difference in a countenance. Difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300, 
and watch God move. 